What's up? Welcome in. Wes Mitchell, Chris Clark, GC Live, Monday episode of the show, Life After Limbo for South Carolina. Just seems like the perfect way to describe it. Uh, we'll, of course, be talking quite a bit about the loss of Pete Limbo for South Carolina as he moves on to Buffalo as the head football coach there. First, going to tell you about our friend Clint Hammond of Movement, MortgageClintHammond.com, 803-771-6933. Clint, our presenting sponsor here on the show for over two years now. Appreciate Clint. As we always tell you, if you're in the market to buy a new home or you've just been thinking about going from renting to buying and just want to know, hey, what can I afford? What is this process like? How do I go about getting a mortgage? Important and all that. Clint will sit down with you absolutely free, talk you through that process, and then ho hopefully, ultimately, get you in a home of your own. So again, clintonhammond.com for more information. 803-771-6933. Life after limbo. Uh, Chris, what does that mean for South Carolina? I feel like that's a loaded question, man. Um, you know, Be Beamer has had to replace coaches before. That's part of it. That's part of life in college athletics. But, I mean, I, I would probably say this is – maybe his biggest hire to date just in terms of what he is having to replace. I mean, obviously, anytime you hire a coordinator of any kind, it's going to be important. It's going to be a big hire for the future of your program. But limbo just meant so much to how this program has been built so far that, in my opinion, goes beyond the scope of just even the title special teams coordinator. This is a big hire because of who and what you're replacing in Pete Limbo. Well, it is, and it might not be as significant at some other programs. It's significant because – more significant because of how Shane Beamer has chosen, I think, Wes, to structure his program. And then the fact that not only have you put that huge emphasis on it, but you also have had Pete Limbo, who is, quite frankly, just – one of the more unique characters in college football and a unique coach because he's really, really good. He has head coaching experience. He's got different ties. You know, Shane Beamer, Wes, and, and with hiring Pete Limbo, he really turned the whole, you know, special teams is a third of a game from a platitude that you hear a lot in coaching. And that's actually how they structure their program, right? The, Special teams is just ingrained in everything they do. You, we've heard Pete Limbo talk about it. When they go to recruit guys, one of the things that they check off is, does he play special teams? Is he willing to play special teams? It's not just can he catch passes? Can he beat a block, you know, as a defensive end? They really, really look at special teams, and it is very, very important to them. And so when you lose a coach the caliber of Pete Limbo at any position, it's tough. But with him being a coordinator for a spot that really and truly has been one third of the game, very important for South Carolina, you know, I think that kind of really enhances uh, the loss here. He'll, there's no doubt he'll be tough to replace. They could bring in somebody who ends up being excellent, and we could still look back and say, man, losing Pete Limbo, that was tough, right? Just because of the personality, the recruiting ties, the relationship he has with Beamer, former head coach, you know, so he brings that perspective. And obviously just really, really good at what he does in the area of special teams. Hey, almost Chris, you are you're kind of replacing two co as well. You're replacing mm -hmm. your your special teams coordinator our head coach. And so and this thing goes as deep some places that may that may just like that may be something that looks fancy. It may be something that's good for a resume. Based on what I've heard. I think it went a little bit deeper than that here at South Carolina. And I think with Limbo, I mean, you even look at the fact that South Carolina uses the same terminology for things with their special teams that they do throughout offense and defense as well. Here's the thing about football. You spend enough time around football coaches, you notice there are all these buzzwords and uh, <laughs> vernacular, and there's like you, you almost need your own um, – what is the little the little table of contents that with a um, what what's the little thing that used to be when you were a kid and it would just have like the definitions of words that were just for that particular book um, in, in class? Index. 
little glossary, I think. Yeah, um, you, you almost need that for football because every coach has these it, it could be the same concept, the same technique, the same thought, and there's 15 words for it. Well, w- one thing that Limbo felt important and sort of, I, I believe, had a big hand in it at South Carolina was he wanted for all the terminology, all the vernacular to be the same from special team standpoint all the way down to offense, defense, spe- and then special teams, of course. Well, this was all by design, and he wanted for his special teams drills to also help you if you were a defensive player or an offensive player. So there it was a uh, connectivity within the program that I, I thought Limbo brought. And uh, – and talk about a guy who I think just took his responsibilities incredibly seriously in terms of I I'm you know I may not agree with everything my head coach says every single decision you know and I, I think you he was a guy who could disagree with a decision behind closed doors give an opinion behind closed doors but once we exit that office. I, I know what my marching orders are, and I know that I'm here to serve the head coach. And so I, I think you don't always have that in, in college football. You have, you know, you have coaches, maybe, maybe they let it be known if they disagree with, with some decisions inside the building. And I, I just felt like limbo was the perfect amount of old school and sort of um, how he treated kind of the hierarchy within a coaching staff while also being very new school in terms of understanding analytics and understanding the effect of special teams on a game, if you can steal a possession, all things like that. So you're not going to find very many people that are that detail-oriented, that care that much about sort of where their role is within a program, are also incredibly intelligent, and then, frankly, are just well-liked by – by everyone that that you hear has a relationship with him. I mean, this has to be one of the most well-liked guys that has ever coached at South Carolina, kind of top to bottom, just looking at what you hear behind the scenes, but then the responses when Limbo left. And so, I mean, I think there's a lot of people that obviously understand the football side of this, like the on-field side, but I think there's a lot of people that probably will just miss having Pete Limbo around. Yeah, I mean, who who else is going to give crazy nicknames and tell, you know, have Winston Churchill references and all that in press conferences? It's going to be uh, it's going to be tough to replace. And we we were talking about that earlier, man. And you know, typically the opinions are split on people. You'll you'll see pretty big splits among the fan base, even when things are going really well. You know, you'll see that sometimes. And Pete Limbo is the one coach that you can point to and and there's almost a universal respect and like for the guy, not only because of his personality, but just, you know, how successful those units have been. And I think Wes, something you, for me, I've learned a lot more about special teams hearing from Pete Limbo and hearing how kind of how he does things and how vital it's been to the program build uh, with what South Carolina did, p- particularly those first couple years, right? Surpassing, expectations in 2021 and 2022 you know in the past you kind of think about ah make a big play on special teams right and certainly that was a big part of what Pete Limbo brought the the self-professed library of fakes those are fun you know it's really fun to watch all that take place but you kind of miss um you kind of miss certain things about special teams whether it's just hidden yardage stealing a possession the, the thing that I did not realize is how interconnected it all could be. And it's exactly what you were talking about earlier. I think the fact that they they have integrated special teams into everything that they do, that they have used the same terminology, I think spending so much time on special teams has made the offensive and defensive players better football players and vice versa. And um, a lot of the drills that they did with Limbo on special teams are drills that they're not special teams drills, like they're football drills. They're going to make you better at blocking and tackling. And um, he was just, he's just a really good football coach in that way. And I think 
his results, sure, they showed up in special teams, but I think they showed up in some other areas at times too. Yeah, just a, a detail-oriented human being, I feel like, in everything he does, bit of a perfection. You know, and I, I'm sure there were times where the guys probably rolled their eyes like, hey, golly, Coach Limbo's got us doing this again. And But I, I think there's a certain level of respect in knowing God makes me better. Like, th this coach helps me improve. And so I, I think – for, for football players, for, for guys that are like sort of that tuned into their craft, the, the way to earn their respect and trust is to show them, hey, what we're doing is going to make you a better player, make you better. Limbo did that. It's still one of my favorite stories, man, talking. I, I won't name the, the guy, but talking to one of the specialists a couple of off seasons ago, and uh, we were at an event that was a, an NIL thing, and they were like, yeah, Coach Limbo had us watching um, every single explosive play from last year. And uh, that was like their homework for, for that day, for their own personal, I guess, meeting time. They were having to go over every explosive play. And I was sitting there, I was like, you know, that, that doesn't really sound that bad. Like, how, how many could it be? And uh, they talked more and more and more. And I was like, wait a second. I thought y'all were talking about every explosive play either gained or allowed on special teams at South Carolina. They're like, no, um, for the entire country last year. And so <laughs> the specialist watching literally every single explosive play, both from a positive standpoint, what did we, what did they in this case do right? Or what did they do wrong to allow this explosive play? And th that just kind of, to me was the perfect little anecdote to describe the attention to detail that is Pete Limbo. And um, you, you just – all all coaches have it, a certain attention to detail, but you don't really see it quite to the level that I think you do with a guy like Pete Limbo. And there's – hey, man, there's a reason Buffalo hired him. Like, I think this is a great hire for those guys, man. He's had other opportunities that maybe weren't quite as big of jobs. Or maybe they don't quite fit as much, fit as well. And he's really not even – it hasn't seemed like he's pursued those other jobs. But I, yeah. I think this one, I imagine given, you know, that he's from New York, it probably was just very hard for him to say no. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, a Matt job where he's been before, he has familiarity with that landscape, that conference. He's from Staten Island, New York, like you said. Um, got a five-year contract. so. But we, I think we all knew, like when when Shane Beamer hired Pete Limbo, I, I knew who Pete Limbo was. I'd heard about him, heard he was a good coach. When you when he was hired, and you look back at the profile, you go, okay, this guy's been a head coach three times. Like, how long will he be here if this goes well? And so you got you got three good years out of it. I think we all heard Wes independently at some point or another during Limbo's tenure. Like, yeah, he, he probably wants to go be a head coach again, right? I mean, a lot of times guys that have been head coaches before want to go do it again. Not always. Some of them are like, ah, man, I'd just like to go call plays or be a position coach, whatever it may be. He was one that we always heard wanted to be a head coach again, but we knew that he, he would bide his time and try to find the right fit. And so this one came along. Seems like a great fit for both sides. Um, he definitely has that head coaching mentality. You know, he, he would come to the pressers and it, it seemed like he was the head coach, you know, because he would give the big picture over. He, he just thinks that way. And something that Shane Beamer has mentioned before, Wes, because there's a lot of emphasis on Shane Beamer. Hey, Shane Beamer's never been a coordinator. And one of the things he would say to kind of combat that, that narrative, so to speak, is a hey, special team's. They're the only coordinator that stands in front of the whole team. You know, they work from guys from offense, from defense. They work with kickers, punters, snappers, everybody. And and so Pete Limbo definitely takes that kind of holistic approach as well. So uh, good for him. Again, great opportunity, it looks like, for, for both sides there. Yeah, and I, I don't want to pretend I completely know on this, man, but it, it just sort of felt to me like Limbo wanted to run his own program again, but that it was only going to be something – 
that that made a ton of sense and probably that he really felt like could be successful. Like I, I always got the impression that he was pretty, you know, like he was happy with where he was at. But if the right situation came along, that he very clearly, obviously by his actions at this point, wanted to be a head coach again. So uh, again, wish him well, man. He'll do. I think he'll do very well up there, honestly. And um, you know, will be but interesting to see. Does anybody with South Carolina ties end up on his staff? You know, we've we've seen, um, I guess Jody Wright hire one of South Carolina's analysts, um, be a special teams coordinator. Be very interested to see if there's some guys in smaller roles at South Carolina that end up in bigger roles on Limbo's staff. Complete speculation on my part, but uh, for South Carolina, lots of different ways Beamer could go here, man. He's got the opening now. He has said multiple times now, hey, when I went to hire Limbo, if if I couldn't have gotten Limbo or somebody, you know, of the caliber of Limbo, of which there are a few, then I would have just run the special teams myself. However, I, I do wonder, Chris, like, I, I don't think we can rule that out. Like, because he said it publicly, he said it multiple times. I don't think we can completely rule that out by any stretch. However, don't you kind of feel like after three years at the helm and seeing everything that's on a coach's plate? Like, I, I just, I wonder if adding something as important as special teams have been to this organization as a whole onto your plate as a head coach. It's just, it's just a lot to have to to have to manage, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you're you're right, especially nowadays. I mean, not that when Shane Beamer took this job things are easy because he was uh navigating being a first time head coach during COVID when he couldn't couldn't recruit anybody. I mean, it is pretty tough, right? That that was a welcome to welcome to the SEC, welcome to being a head coach. You got to do all this during COVID. That that was probably a pretty gritty introduction. Um, and then having some other things happen, you know, you, your offensive coordinator leaves, you know, before he, I mean, he's in the building doing some things, but leaves very shortly after. I mean, there were some things uh, early in that tenure. But yeah, now, I mean, you're in the NIL era, right? Transfer portal era. There's even more for coaches to worry about. The recruiting calendar, team management. Uh, I think Wes, I think I'm going to say think slash no, because we, we've got several pieces of evidence in this thing that I think we can cobble together. You could start with this very small one, but Shane Beamer in congratulating Pete Limbo on Twitter on his Twitter account said, Hey, we have a lot of interest in this position because of what Pete Limbo has done here. Right? So there's your first sign. And also we've just heard, behind the scenes that the, the thought process is that Shane Beamer is going for a replacement special teams coach here. Now, could it get to a point where he says, I'm just going to handle it myself. Maybe if he shifts his thinking, maybe if he talks to some guys, Wes, and doesn't find the right fit like last time where he's saying, Hey, it's got to be limbo or a guy like limbo. Maybe he doesn't find that, but it seems like the current thought is go in, hire a dedicated special teams coach keep this thing going it, it'll be tough to replace Pete, but you know i think that's what they'll i think that's what he's looking for right now if we had to say yeah man and i, I think uh it, it, w it will be tough to replace him and i i think th the interesting thing there will be all right do, do you go hire a guy but do you sort of if it is a younger guy do you maybe just do things a little bit differently you know do you sort of say look with limbo it was those are yours. And I'm sure Beamer was involved just because he likes special teams and he has special teams knowledge. But I'm sure if he had a ton going on as a head coach on a particular day or week, he had no problem whatsoever letting Limbo just go handle everything. I wonder, all right, do you hire a guy and, um, and let them have full autonomy of special teams like you did Limbo? And I also wondered, are, are you going to go hire a, a guy with the experience of Limbo and, and also make him 
your associate head coach, or is there a chance that the new coach is just focused on special teams? Or even, Chris, we have to at least acknowledge the possibility of somebody being special teams plus a- another position group. Like, I-, I know Beamer has said in the past he likes how Limbo could just focus on special teams. But it- is there a scenario where you have a special teams coordinator plus position coach, Beamer also helps with special teams, and then – you know, you you give associate head coach title to somebody else on staff. Like, you kind of have some options. The, pro- the problem for us right now, man, is we don't have complete information on if, if Beamer sort of reached in his desk and pulled out a little sheet of paper with his five names <laughs> on it, this would be a lot easier. But we don't, we don't know what those five names are. Yeah, three three names, five names, seven names. Do you think that do people people always say, yeah, I keep a list. Do you think people literally keep the list? Maybe they do, just for the heck of it. But uh, whether it's a mental or physical list, like shit, this didn't come as a surprise to Shane Beamer. Like, there's no doubt about it. It could have been after year one, after year two, or after year three, or set at some point down the road if it didn't happen this year you had to know if you're Shane Beamer, hey, it's possible somebody's going to come try to hire Pete, and if it's the right fit, he may go do it. And so that's what's happened. He surely had that in mind. And you're right, we are working off incomplete information right now because we're still trying to run down, you know, who are some candidates. We have a couple, few people that we think are in the mix, will be in the mix, but um, still working to gather more information on that. I think with the picture we do have, Wes, it does. I think you can pick out the preferences, right? I think in a perfect world, if Shane Beamer could hire, could find somebody to hire who can give you continuity from the standpoint of you, you feel good about putting the special teams in that person's hands. That may be because that's the setup you had before and it worked great. But that setup was with Pete Limbo, who, as you said earlier, Wes, there are not a lot of guys out there like him. And so he'll have to feel good about that. And then if there are any responsibilities that need to be adjusted, shuffled, you always have the option to to do that, of course. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, all right. So a couple of different games, and we'll dive into the coaches that are new on staff and our because they did have a press conference on Friday and we show since then, but Chris, and by the way, for subscribers, y'all go check out the After Limb article that I guess would kind of works in this podcast. And to be clear, we like we don't have that list or list of names yet, but there's at least a couple of guys that either we've heard floating around or in the very least would make some sense. Instantly, the first name that came to my mind, Chris, was Stanton Weber. And so Stanton was someone that was here on staff at the beginning. Bo's right-hand man was a special teams analyst first couple of years and then landed a full-time special teams coordinator job for Toledo. And now talking about a much younger person than Limbo, much less experienced. I think he's 30. And so this would be a little bit approach. You probably wouldn't give him associate head coach title as well. But if you wanted to keep the Pete Limbo system, for lack of a better way to say it, the the same approach with a different personality, obviously, everybody's got to be themselves. But if you wanted some level of continuity, this would be your hire, I think. It's just a matter of the Shane Beamer. Is he ready to put that on somebody that's not very old? You know, ba- basically, like, I know they respect him. I know they like him, but is he ready for for this? Yeah, it's it's a big deal, big job, and um, huge shoes to fill. And a guy that has only been the special teams guy in terms of being the coordinator for what a, a year at Toledo West, 
and has done, from what I understand, a good job there as well. Was with Pete Limbo for the 2021 and 2022 seasons here. All the indications that we got is that Pete Limbo and Shane Beamer both really liked him, were really impressed with him. Wes, you pulled up that uh, the quote from Shane Beamer that uh, he gave us, uh, I guess, after 2022, right? After Stanton Weber left to go to Toledo and just how highly he thought of him and, and the job that he, he did said that, you know, when he was at Oklahoma, Stanton Weber was at Kansas State, his alma mater, played a big role in the special teams there as an analyst. And Beamer was like, man, whoever is running their special teams is doing a really good job. And I would like to hire him if I ever get a job. And so brought him in to work under Pete Limbo. So like you say, there is continuity there. Stanton's a real sharp guy. That will be a question, right? The experience that, you know, recruiting, how is he as a recruiter? How is he with commanding a room? Like he knows it, right? He knows special teams. There's no doubt about it. And he's been in some different systems. He's been in limbo system. He's familiar with all that. That could give you some continuity. But there's a lot of factors to consider there, especially with a job this big following somebody like uh, somebody following somebody like Pete Limbo. Yeah, so Beamer said, quote, uh, this is from actually almost exactly a year ago. So um, Weber got the job at Toledo, and Tyler Zelensky, who actually I was talking about earlier, I didn't name him, but that is was hired by Jody Wright to run teams. And so he was here as the, uh, the analyst in place of Stanton. We, we always kind of heard – Stanton Weber is a huge part of, of what Limbo is doing in, in Columbia. And so lots of respect there. Beamer's quote, I thought just kind of went well beyond, well above your typical niceties that you see a coach sort of throw out there after a guy leaves. He told us a year ago, Stanton was awesome. I know the impact he had on special teams at Kansas State. Played against him, as like Chris said, played against him for three years at Oklahoma. I always told myself I'd be on the special teams at Kansas State get a head coaching job I want to try to hire that guy and that was Stanton basically he was awesome worked his butt off and had a lot of input with Pete and made our special teams better I'm always happy for any of our guys that get the opportunity to advance their career whether it be Stanton this year or Joe Bowl year I want to hire great people and empower them and help them in advance and this was a great opportunity for Stanton to go to a really good program and run the special teams himself and really excited for him so not to read too much a entire year ago, but I got to think he'll at least call him and check in, talk to him. If not just to let Stanton Weber have the experience of going through the interview process. Sometimes for young guys, that's, that, that's something I think you do as a head coach to help your guys who have been with you and have done things the right way to help them to continue to grow as coaches as well. Yeah, I, I anticipate, I'd i be shocked if we look back on this and hear uh, Beamer didn't even call Stanton Weber, didn't even didn't even consider him. Um, I, I don't know what level to rise to, but, man, I, I feel certain that he's at least a guy that Beamer said, okay, Stanton Weber, you know, if, if, if Pete ever leaves, is he a guy that I need to consider? Would he be ready? And – what he lands on as far as the answer to that, I, I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm sure it's got to be part of the process, right? And I'm sure there'll be other coaches um, who are special teams guys as well uh, that'll be considered well. Yeah, before we move any further, Chris, uh, going to tell everybody about our friends at Game Time and the Game Time app. Go to Game Time if you're looking for tickets right now or just game. And, uh, Kentucky, South Carolina, by the way, uh, that's going to actually be a pretty tough ticket tomorrow night at CLA. Our friends at Game Time, they've got you covered. Uh, you can just type it in, just other ticket app. And the beauty of this is if you find a ticket game section, the Game Time guarantee will uh, refund you 110% of what you paid if you find a ticket for cheaper for the same game in the same section. Restrictions do apply on that, so check all the fine also, limited time, if you type in the code GAMECOCKS, so that's just GAMECOCKS, into the account settings, you will get $20 
off your first order on Game Time on the Game Time app. Just hit account, hit redeem code, enter code Gamecocks, and then your first purchase, first purchase only, you get twenty dollars off that. I was actually looking. We we got friends. Uh, I actually have uh, in laws, my brother in law, sister in law, who are huge Ravens fans, Chris. So I was looking on there. It's like, man, Ravens, Chiefs next. Seeing Mahomes, getting to see Lamar Jackson in person with a free place to stay, kind of tempting. Tempting, very tempting. If we make the move, I don't think we will. I think we'll watch on TV. But if we do, game time. I think you do it. I think you should do it. Just do it. Just screw it and do it. Do it, man. Uh, it would be fun. So if we do, I'll, I'll let y'all know. I'll post it on Twitter. But game time app will be the place we do it. Uh, as far as this hire, man, did you do you want to give any other names, or do you want to just let the these let's, subscribers? Yeah, there's there's one more. Well, yeah, I was going to give it away, and then you and then you talked me out of it. Let we yeah, go give it, man. If you if you want to. Uh, all right, here here's the deal. Okay, I like it. Well, I like how we talk. We can talk through things on the show. It's not that serious. Here's the deal. I'll give it to you, but if you're not a subscriber, you have to promise. To at least consider this deal that Wes just put up on the screen there. One dollar for two months. Code SCAR1. Please don't yell at Wes about the code. I don't like SCAR. I hate when they say that. We didn't come up with it. But it will get you a dollar for two months. So you, you should like the code. GamecockCentral.com. When you go to check out, one dollar for two months. Code SCAR1. It'll get you. So here's, here's another one, Wes, that I'm keeping an eye on. Right. And and don't go tweet. Chris Clark said this guy's the favorite. I, I'm not saying that, but someone that I expect to draw some level of consideration is Scott Fountain. Uh, currently at Arkansas has had has been at different SEC programs, Wes, in a lot of different capacities. So he's someone that's got remember how Shane Beamer talked about positional versatility uh, for James Coley that in that he had. He'd been an offensive coordinator, a co-OC, wide receivers coach, tight ends coach, and a high school coach. Like he's coached a bunch of different things. Scott Fountain at Arkansas, he's actually their assistant or associate head coach and special teams coordinator. Uh, he's been the special teams coordinator at Georgia, 2019, Mississippi State, 2018. Um, he also was a special teams analyst at Georgia in 2017, and that's when Shane Beamer was there uh, as the special teams coach slash tight ends coach. He's been a personnel director. He's coached tight ends. He's coached offensive line. So Fountain has, you know, a long history at several different positions at programs. And, of course, there is some familiarity with Shane Beamer, and he's a special teams guy. So just another name to kind of kind of file away there. Yeah, one to keep an eye on, and I'm sure – Poss possibly we'll we'll hear some more in the coming days. We'll you know we'll see. There's not really, I mean, every coach wants to have a spot filled, right? There's a massive rush to just make it happen in in two days. Like if he has his guy, then yeah, it'll be an easy, quick process. But I don't feel a huge crunch. Signing days over. Transfer portal window, for all intents and purposes, the window of people leaving is over for the most part. The recruits out there making their decisions and have picked and South Carolina has already started class. So there's not some huge push like there normally is during a lot of different windows, his calendar, you know, to, to push through a move. So we'll see how quickly this one happens. Let, let's go back quickly and then we'll get out of this. The official hires last week. So we got new Beamer sound. We got some stuff from Coley. We heard from Blackwell. What, uh, if anything, stood out to you the most out of what those three had to say? This sounds a little silly, Wes, <laughs> but uh, James Coley, I think he just has a really interesting disposition about him um, where you can see, like, I could see how this guy has all these ties down in South Florida where he's from, and he he's really effective at going into these living rooms and building these relationships with high school coaches and seven-on-seven -seven coaches and trainers, right, handlers, so to speak. 
Um, he just he he's he's been through a lot of those battles, and he's been through you know again going back to earlier, coached a lot of different positions, a lot of different types of personalities, and so I, I just liked listening to him talk in general about things, uh, but just hearing about his room and the plans he has for it, as far as all the different types of personalities, different sizes of guys, and just how in this day and age. Obviously, you can have a lot of turnover in a room. You have a lot of guys leave year over year. You can bring in a lot of new guys. And so balancing that is a big part nowadays of being a position coach. So I was just no, – no, like, big picture takeaway other than I was just really interested to hear from Coley for the first time in that setting. And uh, I, I thought what he had to say was interesting. I, I thought the most interesting thing that we heard was Shane Beamer talking about bringing Gilbert Edmond back and kind of th this was some stuff, you know, we, we had heard that this was not something that was taken lightly in terms of the decision to, bring back. but you know, and you can go read about it if you want to kind of central. I think that's even a free story, but Chris, the level of depth that sort of went into this decision all the way down to, I, I don't know why this part just stood out to me, but caught my attention. The, um, you know, Gilbert, you you can't have number eight again. Like you can't have your cool number. You have you have to go take fifty five, which I guess was the number he started with. The guys change numbers so much so often. I had forgotten that, but just the the level that Beamer went to to Edmund basically prove he really wanted to be here for all the right reasons, and that uh, you know he just wanted to come back and and be accepted back, you know, within his teammates or within the locker room. I thought that was both interesting and sort of just kind of point that you're not going to come back to if you enter the portal. Like this is kind of a, I don't want to say it'll never happen again because there will possibly be circumstances where it does. But I, I think with Gilbert, it, it did, you know, Travis says seems humble. Yeah, I thought there was a certain level of maturity in, in how he's handled coming back. He's put his head down. You know, I think he just wants to go to work and and, and you know and and put a head down going to work. Gilbert Edmond could actually really help this football team. I think. Yeah, it, the the reactions were interesting, Wes. And look, whatever you think about Gilbert Edmond, I think it was important to kind of. Take a, take a beat, take a step back, and try to let some more information come out about how this happened, right? And so now that we know behind the scenes a little bit more how it happened, now that we've heard from Beamer, heard some of what Gilbert said via Beamer, for people who were maybe concerned about this, maybe that left some more context into the into the picture. Um, you know, we, we get really mad nowadays about saying, oh, guys are so entitled and blah, blah, blah. Well, here you have a situation where a guy left, wants to come back, and it, you know, not making all these demands. Hey, I want, I want my number. I want to start. I want to make sure, hey, what's the deal with NIL? There was none of that. And, in fact, they, in some form or fashion, kind of tried to talk him out of it a little bit. Hey, man, this may be pretty tough, right? You got a, a, basically a new room. There's a couple guys in there you know. Some of your teammates may not be in love with the idea of it. So you'll have to kind of rebuild that trust. Don't expect that people are going to be itching to give you a bunch of NIL money. Can't have your number. I mean, a lot of different things, right? And for Gilbert to say, hey, no, I, I still want to come back and be part of the program. Um, that That is kind of the opposite of the thing that we get so mad about now with the entitlement. So I, I would think people would actually kind of gravitate towards that and appreciate that. So some of the reactions have been kind of interesting. But just purely on the field, Wes, Gilbert had a pretty good year in 2022, and I think there's still some growth and some upside, some development that could take place here. And uh, that could be what the doctor ordered for South Carolina, because even bringing in Dylan Stewart, Kyle Kennard, there's still some questions at edge. And this is, I think, a win-win if you can get this guy in and he can give you what he did in 2022 or maybe better. That could be, you know, significant for the defense. Yeah, and you could ever, ever have up front side or defense 
pass rushers of all types are always heavily wanted, I, I think. So I like that who has some experience and uh, can either be a be a reserve guy, maybe he pushes for a starting job. Uh, I think it's important to keep building depth. All right, guys, tax time right around the corner. No better group of people to have do your taxes than our friends at Liberty Tax. Three convenient locations here in the Columbia area. 803-462-5576. Uh, Larry and his team at Liberty Tax, they're going to take fantastic care of you. And Chris Clark, I know you and your family have been talking to Larry for a few months now. Tax time settled. And uh, tax time, I, I'm starting to get alerts. My email alerts in the mailbox. Hey, your tax, this W-2 is here, 1099, all this stuff. Here's forms. It is officially tax time. It is, it is about that time, Wes. And actually, you mentioned Larry meeting with him. I've talked to him several times. We met with him already last year, meeting with him again in February, early in February. Absolutely no tax anxiety in the Clark household. We feel great about it. He's putting together a plan for us. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're a business owner, you need to make sure you have a great handle on your tax situation. Larry and his team, they can help you out with it. 803 462 5576. Give them a call today. For sure, man. Uh, shout out, Larry, again, as always, for supporting us here on uh, GC Live. About the takeover hour that is on 107.5, 11 to noon every single day. But, Chris, so let's close it out, man. A couple of roster notes from the end of last week as that official roster came out. Um, Tyshawn Wanamaker, Trey Jones, not on South Carolina's roster that they put out. Ja'Kai Moore is on there, listed as a graduate student. Looks like he will, I guess, use his sixth year, you would say, his COVID year of eligibility. And um, so I think we finally do kind of have a little bit of an idea. Now, you know, Beamer did a little bit open that Trey Jones could return, left the door open. But as of right now, again, two of those guys not on the roster. Ja'Kai Moore is. We kind of get the – I guess the word there of why South Carolina did keep stacking talent out of the transfer portal on the offensive line. It wasn't just building depth. It was probably in anticipation of some of these things happening. Yeah, I think you had a combination of those, right, where South Carolina said, hey, if there's an offensive lineman that we feel like can help, that can uh, you know, continue to build depth, I, I think you – have put this well, Wes, a while back that, that the staff was just determined, hey, let's not have last year happen again. And, hey, if, if you go into 2024 and have nine, ten injuries on the offensive line, you're still not going to be in great shape because it's really, really hard to weather that situation. But they clearly wanted to build some more depth, increase the competition there. But, Wes, around the time where they took Kamar Bell from FAU, to be what would be the 17th scholarship offensive lineman. You're going, is there another move to come here? Like is somebody moving on? We have been tracking the potential of a move or two on the offensive line. Most notably, Tyshawn Wanamaker, that one ended up happening. Trey Jones admittedly kind of came out of nowhere. I, I, I didn't really know that that one would happen. But, yeah, it appears he is walking away from the game. And so best of luck to him and, and to Tyshawn. That gives you now, I believe, it'll be 15 guys in that offensive line room. That's a number that makes sense. That's not really an atypical number. And, you know, that com that's comprised of transfers, freshmen, and the guys that you've got coming back on the roster. So, yeah, an effort definitely to, to continue to try to build more depth there. Uh, but they won't have Wanamaker, who's played a good bit of ball in Columbia, obviously. And then Trey Jones, Wes, who was, you know, inserted as a starter in the Florida game last year and had, had, had done some good things throughout his career as well. Yeah, and, and man, Jones, a guy that I, um, I mean, this was like a week ago. I was sitting there saying, "Hey, guys, don't don't forget about Trey Jones." Like we're talking about all these newcomers and the guys who were freshmen last year, and so we we're sitting there saying, "Look, this guy went healthy. He provided some some push up front." Him, remember what also happened that week against Florida? They implemented a little bit more. Like the power run game, trying to sort of go with what you would call like gap scheme, pulling guards. They liked the power 
that he added sort of to that spot. And um, while he was in, before he got hurt again, I think he got hurt at a and you, you saw some improvements from the offensive line. So, um, you know, that, that's a guy I thought could potentially push for a starting job this coming year. But I, I made the point earlier, Chris, it, it takes a lot out of you to play college football. And when you get to four or five, six years in the game, I mean, this is a physical, physical sport. And if you are not completely in it mentally and uh, and physically, just if your heart is not in it, for, for some of these older guys, like this is not that uncommon for players to decide to move on from the game of, of football. So I, I, I kind of, I saw some reactions where people were just like, why is this happening? What is this? I, I just, I don't think this is uncommon at all. If you're not sort of projected to be an NFL guy and, you know, in the case of, of a couple of these guys, honestly, you started to probably see, am I being recruited over? There are young players that are pushing for playing time at my position. Those young players are now going to be in their second year, so they're only going to be getting better. You start to see the writing on the wall. It, I mean, it takes heart and determination, and you got to be 100% in it to want to get up. It's not to get up to go play in front of 80,000 people on a Saturday. It's to want to get up every single day in the offseason and go, you know, get yelled at and have to hustle and run and do all the different sacrifices that come with being a college football player. So sometimes if you're an upperclassman and you got your degree, you're like, I, I came here, I played, it's just time to, to move on. And I, I'm not talking specifically like I know exactly what those two guys are thinking, so don't take it that way. But just in general, we got to acknowledge there might be some great perks to being a college football player, but there's a lot of work and a lot of responsibility that comes as well. Well, and even in the NFL West, you see guys that literally make it to the highest level of the game, and they don't necessarily have injuries or a concussion history. They say, I'm done. You know, I, I I played. I'm good. And and so I think a lot of times we think in terms of these guys being some kind of like football robot where they're programmed and then they, you know, want to go make, and say, oh, well, you were a starting college football player or maybe you had some pro potential, but these are still humans. And so they have different priorities and different things that happen in life. Um, and, and a lot of them, Wes, are situations just like you laid out where they've graduated or they, they see what's going on on the roster. Other times we may, there may be situations that come up and it doesn't really make sense to us because we're not really sure, you know, what's going on in people's lives. Um, you see all different forms of that. So I think even Tyshawn and Trey, different situations even between both of those two guys, you know. So um, we'll definitely be interesting uh, because I was with you before we found out that Trey Jones was walking away. He was one of those guys that we were going, don't really forget about this guy, right? There's been there's a lot of bodies on that interior of the offensive line. And so, you know, take him out of that equation at this time. And even then, you've still got, I think, a pretty interesting picture up front as to as to what it may ultimately look like in there. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, that's going to do it for today, Monday show. Um, we'll wrap it up here. Appreciate all of our sponsors for being there for us, as always. Appreciate all of you listening, as always. Uh, Michael says, any news from this past Junior Day weekend? Yeah, we got a we got a story up. Not not a huge, just like breaking amount of news or anything like that, but we do have some reactions. I'll have a story with Ryan Montgomery, four-star quarterback, going up actually in about three minutes i think it's set to go up so check that out south carolina very much in that one probably the top one or two school uh, i think with ryan so that recruitment could be winding down here shortly but yeah appreciate y'all we had a lot to cover there hopefully we hit most of it we'll be back mike will be on on tuesday chris and i will likely be back on wednesday so appreciate all of you for hanging out hanging in he's chris i'm wes we'll see y'all